Charles Keep and Alex Trevor Lines. I'm really delighted to welcome you to the Mosaic Rooms uh, here in Ells Court. Um, for those that don't know, the Mosaic Rooms are a fantastic space uh, fostering understanding of the Arab region and beyond and intercultural exchange and dialogue. And we're sitting in the middle of this uh, beautiful exhibition here. So I encourage you to take some time to enjoy that, um, as well as the bookshop at, at the front as you, as you make your way out. Um, and also just want to say special thanks to Omar here, not just for the interview and alliance, but for, for hosting us here, here today. So um, it's a real pleasure to have you all. Um, the objective of our event today, the common of all our breakfast club um, debates, is to illuminate the special feature which focuses on a particular topic in philanthropy. And in this case, we're focused today on the task of philanthropy, which is why it's a, again, a particular appropriate setting for the conversation. Uh, we'll be looking at what is task of philanthropy, what it does, highlight some of the key issues, trends, controversies, drawing on uh, the content in the special feature in our March issue. And for you to be able to assess how well we've achieved that objective, we have evaluation forms on your seats, and we'd be really grateful if you take the time to think during the course of the panel about um, uh, what we can do to improve them um, for future events, and make sure you make your views um, clear, however critical they are. Um, and there's also, for those that aren't already subscribers, 20% off subscriptions for anyone that um, subscribes um, today. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, the panel and the panel format. Um, as you know, we tend to keep the events here as informal as possible uh, and include as much participation and discussion from all of you as from our, our panelists alongside me. Um, the hashtag for those that want to use it is Diaspora Philanthropy, so I encourage you to tweet. Um, so, our uh, special feature, which was guest edited by um, Dr. Mark Seidel from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, uh, which means unfortunately you can't be uh, here today. Um, really tried to look at what has been happening in diaspora philanthropy since he last focused on the topic and since there was previous academic interest almost two decades ago. And thanks to his involvement, we have assembled contributions and pieces from around the world in keeping with Alliance's mission to global orientation. So there's perspectives from Pakistan, India, Kashmir, Palestine, Israel, Canada, uh, Ireland, uh, and beyond. And we encourage you to obviously read some of the pieces. Um, and what was emerging from some of the um, special feature um, questions was an ongoing problem of a lack of data and research scholarship about the field of diaspora philanthropy. Um, that was one big observation that, that was recurring. The second was that diaspora philanthropy can sometimes have overlaps with politics and nationalism. And some diaspora communities were supporting um, uh, national nationalist causes in their home country. So there could be a, arguably a dark side to diaspora philanthropy as well as all the positives one thinks about what one thinks about giving across borders. And that raises questions about how it should be regulated and managed. Um, there was also observations about new intermediaries emerging, particularly aided by technology, uh, so new forms of giving across borders, and we'll probably hear a bit more about that from Eleanor on the panel on my um, right shortly. Um, and there was also some observations about how diaspora philanthropy have become more sophisticated and more diverse. More sophisticated in that in previous generations as was uh, associations of giving to what was one observer called backyard initiatives to maybe more sophisticated subjects and causes of being supported. Um, but also that there's more diversity rather than literature and reflecting just on US and UK diaspora given to host countries there's actually a greater diversity and ecosystem of diaspora giving which makes this topic uh, so so timely. Um, so to discuss these issues I'm delighted to be joined by um, on my near right Mahina Rangin Waller who's the director of the Rangin Waller Foundation, a family foundation involved in philanthropy across generations to India. Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Burma, and in the UK and more. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Um, thank you. And um, on my far right here, Eleanor uh, Hansen, who is the CEO of Global Giving. Um, so, Eleanor, uh, CEO of Global Giving. Um, and then in my immediate left, um, we were going to be joined by Richard Forbes from the British Asian Trust, the CEO, but for family reasons, he wasn't able to. To join the panel, although he is um, in, in attendance. I'm, I'm delighted to have him um, in his place. I'm Abba Tarat Shah, who's the Executive Director of Partnerships and Programs um, at the British Asian Trust. Um, and uh, you have, um, I'm told, um, expertise on giving trends and also the Trust Network on social finance and impact investing. So great to hear a bit more about that. And 
Then on my far left over here, Omar al Qatan, as I say, hosting us today, but also the chair of the um, Qatan Foundation, a family foundation that supports and promotes education and culture in Palestine, the Middle East, and across the Arab region. So I'm sure you agree we've got a rich uh, abundance of knowledge in the room. Um, and I'd just like to hand over now to Helen, who's going to open up uh, with your comments about the work. Um, so it's really wonderful to be here, everybody. Um, so my name is Ellen Harrison, and I'm the Chief Executive of Global Giving UK. So I was asked to touch really on thinking about kind of crowdfunding and the diaspora. Uh, for those of you who've heard me speak before, you probably know what Global Giving does, but I thought it was helpful kind of just to think, you know, first, who is Global Giving? How do we work with the diaspora? And then what do I see is the key challenges and opportunities for engaging with the diaspora in crowdfunding? And their intermediaries. Um, so firstly, who are Global Giving? Um, so Global Giving exists to try and transform aid and philanthropy to accelerate community-led change. Sounds a bit of a jargonistic term, but really that is fundamentally about trying to shift the power so that more money goes directly to local organisations and that we help those local organisations to spend their money in the best possible way on their own terms. So kind of really global giving exists because at the moment, as we all know why we're passionate, I think about diaspora philanthropy, is because too much money is held by too few people. Whether that is Kenya, whether that is Ghana, whether that is Syria, or whether that is the UK. And um, so global giving really focuses on kind of three key audiences for our work. So firstly, it's about community-led organisations, so that idea of driving more money and more opportunities for peer learning. For donors, and that's individual donors and its companies, it's helping them to be more effective actors in community-led development and giving them easy, confident opportunities to drive more money to the local organisation that maybe they've never heard of. And then it is to work with other foundations and with government to really share the data that we have at our fingertips because we're a technology platform to look at how we can adapt policy and process to make it easier to give and kind of avoid some of those risk kind of challenges that stops people giving local. So that's kind of like what global giving does. And just in terms of numbers, um, and I'm reading my phone, I'm not texting, I'm not capable of doing that at the same time, everybody. But um, at the moment, we have worked with about 790,000 donors, supporting 19,000 projects in 171 countries. And uh, so both, it's small when you look at the global picture of philanthropy, but it's also definitely not insignificant. And more than 50% of our partners are what I consider to be truly local. So they are locally registered in their country and they are able to use our technology platform to pitch to donors across the world and give their determination what they think is important. Because we talk about diaspora and philanthropy, what I never want to see is that money becomes too rigid. Because what was always beautiful about diaspora giving was there was greater flexibility and greater ownership on how some of that money was spent. That's probably quite important. So how do we work with the diaspora currently? Um, I would say it's quite ad hoc. Um, about 35% of the donors who gave from the UK last year were from ethnic minorities, according to the data we've been able to give, which is quite high. Um, we are working on both giving time and giving money. Um, and I think kind of the reason why diaspora views global giving is because it's easy, it's transparent, they get feedback on how their money was spent and they're able to really find the community that maybe they have links for, whether it's for work reasons, personal reasons or family reasons. Um, I will say that looking forward for the engagement of wider diaspora groups, technology is fundamental. It is a tool, it's not the solution, but the ability to connect communities in the most remote places, you know, Things go through evolutions, but one of the challenges for the diaspora, no different to anybody else who wants to give, is historically it was very much, you know, an organisation of too much power rested in capital cities when we were trying to get money to countries. That is no longer necessary, particularly with mobile penetration. Um, I'm kind of making an assumption that everybody knows what crowdfunding is in the room, but it's just, you know, it is projects where many people give to a particular project over a particular period of time. It's not rocket science. 
you know, museums, maybe in this museum, I don't know, but churches, kind of mosques, kind of whole kind of communities have been built with crowdfunding over time. It's just digitized and it's fast and it's furious. For individuals in the diaspora, they are using crowdfunding, both local platforms and international platforms, because it's efficient, because there are emotional, tangible connections, kind of, there is some level of vetting and that is hugely varied. If you go use GoFundMe, there is no vetting and people don't mind, so that's interesting. Or you could use global giving and there's lots of vetting. When I see people opting, what I think is vetting is important for some groups, but other people aren't so bothered. They're going to find other ways to trust. Um, but for groups, and this is really important, um, I'm very passionate about diaspora-led organisations in the UK, and I am finding that some of those find crowdfunding very challenging. Because um, me and my colleague Stella, Stella works at Ford and does phenomenal work, but we have just been discussing the process of unlearning. Yeah, so this is where diaspora groups set up in the UK to support communities back home on certain themes, and they learned the British way which was to sit in a cold, dark room and submit a trust funding application and hope that somebody said yes. And that has developed certain habits and this idea of communal giving in some ways has been lost from those organisations. So they need to unlearn the Western way to reconnect with their communities and also refine projects designed in a way that they truly 100% really want to fight for. So we can discuss that in the questions. Um, I wanted to say kind of the key opportunities going forward is that crowdfunding enables transparent collective action. You know, get away with some of the feelings that maybe many people are funding the same thing. It enables you to connect with other funders who are passionate about the same cause. And through artificial intelligence and machine learning, which number of crowdfunding platforms are testing, we are certainly testing, you will find mechanisms to try and nudge and engage diaspora to give and maybe take more risks in their community. Um, but I would say kind of everything going forward will still be about social capital, so that's your trust and relationships. It'll be about human capital, so the skills to be fit for the challenges that communities face and then financial capital, so the sufficient finance, particularly when many of the communities we've got to give with are suffering massive inflation, and inflation in many countries where we are trying to support is not keeping pace with the cost of living, or kind of particularly across the West. So we're earning less, but the costs of actually making a difference are going higher, and people are really challenged with that. Um, I wanted to kind of, like the things that I think people need to think about, beyond the process of unlearning, when you're thinking of technology in the future, is what accountability standards will be needed. So what will people tolerate in terms of an accountability mechanism? People think of philanthropy over here, but what you can learn from the challenges of Uber, or the challenges of Airbnb, and how we trust and how we negotiate, is important for the philanthropy sector. Um, and we really need to think about issues of equity, because it is still true today that Unfortunately, with the commercialization of the internet, which makes sense, but that entire internet is built on an e-commerce model. Yeah, so it is all built around advertising and marketing. So we will still be challenged in the fact that certain communities in the diaspora will benefit more than others. And what do we need to do as philanthropy actors to try and challenge those issues of equity? So really, you know, diverse communities and diverse actors truly get to benefit. Um, I wanted to finish on a partnership that um, I, Point Given, has been fortunate to do with Afford. So we are running a pilot, so we're running a dedicated, curated crowdfunding challenge for diaspora organisations in the UK, um, helping them to learn how to crowdfund and how to network. And there's been phenomenal opportunities, so I love the fact that we chose to collaborate and use the learning from Global Giving and the use the learning from Afford with the diaspora. And there are some successes, but Stella and I also think there are phenomenal challenges because of this desire and this commitment to really ask your friends and your family and your network. And so something that was very traditional in communities seems to have been lost from the organisations that we built. I will say that these organisations are doing awesome work, so if you're here because you care about the diaspora, you should check out the Afford Accelerator and at least make a donation to Afford or Forward because they're doing great work. But we are seeing that people are challenged and people 
they don't necessarily believe enough in how their programs have been designed. So I think it'll be interesting to hear from my fellow kind of speakers. And I haven't, I apologize if I don't articulate it well enough, but I think that looking to the future in diaspora and philanthropy, a critical element will be how projects are co-designed. And when I look at particularly the younger generations, ownership is critical. So what are we doing in designing the projects that we're developing to truly enable people to feel that they're part of it, they're not a donor. Because people don't want to be a donor, they want to be a supporter. And that is really exciting to me. That was probably more than five minutes, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the viewpoint uh, from the kind of uh, cutting edge of technology um, and philanthropy. And now for a, a very different kind of vantage point from Mahina Rangun Walla. I'm um, working and, uh, in and leading a family foundation with, with uh, a, a, a different set of kind of grants, experiences uh, in relation to that with philanthropy. And, uh, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I'm Mahin Rangun Walla from the Rangun Walla Foundation, a foundation set up by my late grandfather in the 60s. We work across the board in health, education, uh, community projects, disability, and arts and culture, especially when it comes to uh, promoting Pakistani arts. Um, we're a global foundation, but we work through three local trusts. So, we have a trust in India, a trust in Pakistan, and a trust in the UK, a registered charity in the UK. Um, Pakistan was the original one set up by my grandfather in the 60s. So uh, we have a big operation on the ground. We run projects in partnership with local organizations and we have a lot of our own projects and programs. So we do a lot of vocational training for women. We have a school, uh, we have a big community center, we have an arts gallery. Um, we, uh, our recent most exciting project is uh, the Princess School of the Traditional Arts, we, which is based in the UK. We have opened a franchise in Pakistan. We do everything from um, a media studies courses to uh, we have a film festival. So uh, lots of exciting things out there. And then when it comes to partnership programs, a lot of the donations we've made in, the, in Pakistan have been quite traditional, so hospital wings, equipment, um, ambulances, that sort of thing. So that's Pakistan, and that we have a, we have a whole team on the ground, and my uncle lives in Pakistan, he runs it over there. Um, UK is head office, and we, we run everything globally. Um, then we have India, which was officially established about 15 years ago, but we also um, have worked there before. That again, we have a big operation on the ground, so we have uh, a CEO base there, and we do a lot of our own projects and programs, um, as well as working in partnership with organizations all across India. So we're based in Mumbai, so we have six community centers in the slums around Mumbai. We run, uh, we do a lot of community outreach through those centers. We also do a lot of vocational training, um, we have scholarship programs, medical assistance programs, we do a lot of advocacy for patients' rights, to, uh, for rights to higher education, um, so that, that, that's all our own stuff, and then um, across the board in health, community, disability projects um, across India, working with partners, some of which we've worked with for, for over 10 years. Uh, so that's India. And then the UK is for you. Uh, Donations in the UK, it was actually set up second in the 70s by my grandfather, originally for UK donations, but now we do uh, UK work as well as global work. Um, anywhere which is not India and Pakistan comes through the UK charity. So we, um, it, 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 we don't actually operate the projects, we, it's more donation type of stuff. So we give one, two, three year um, <coughs> donations and we keep track of them, we have targets, we have agreements, um, and we're lucky enough to be doing anything we're passionate about. Um, so, uh, so actually, a couple of years ago, um, with, with the help of someone, <laughs> with Alison in the school, actually, we came up with a bit of a strategy because it was the sort of thing where people would come to us and say, "What do you fund?" And, um, well, pretty much anything. And how much? Well, we could give you fifty pounds. We could give them. I'm no, not too sure, actually. So, um, so we came up with a bit of a strategy, and now things are much more strategic. So we have different pots people can apply for different amounts, and it's a bit more structured in the UK. And we hope that that's going to be a template for India and Pakistan eventually as well. 
Um, and then we have one program that we um, set up through the UK and operate in the UK, and that's its own registered charity. It's an international disability organisation, a very, very small, called MATES, um, multi agency international training and support. And that is uh, working with uh, professionals who work with children with disabilities and running training programmes throughout the world. We've written some resources, we've got a website which is a bit like a Facebook for people who work with children with disabilities to connect people, um, to provide support. Uh, so that we've run, that's, that I set up about 10 years ago, and we've run that through the UK. Um, and uh, and that, that's pretty much that, that's it actually, that's what we do. Um, a bit of background on me personally, I was born in the UK, uh, I lived a few early years in Pakistan, um, then came, uh, came back, did a bit in Hong Kong, but the UK has basically been my home since I was about eight. Um, I, uh, I was educated here, I went to LSC, I did a, month, I did a degree in geography, which is pretty random, I don't know why I really chose it, but it actually it was a human side of geography and there were a lot of modules on third world, on development, which I took just because they sounded interesting at the time, and then I went on to be a banker actually for a few years, and um, and then and then thought, why am I such a small fish in such a big pond? I could be a bigger fish in a smaller pond. So I went and worked with my dad, who does various things. Um, and somehow I fell into the foundation. I knew that's where I wanted to be, and that sort of linked back to my degree in a way. But uh, that's me. And two kids later, I'm still here, trying my best to manage everything through the UK. Um, but so I, I suppose I have a Pakistani heritage. I'm married to an Indian. Uh, I feel very British, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much your, your diaspora, um, <laughs> and uh, so the way, the way I see it, um, you kind of have two types of diaspora, uh, I'm not as experienced or as knowledgeable as the rest of my uh, panelist members, but uh, this is just the way, the, the way I sort of have experienced and see things. Um, so you have people with uh, limited connection, Back to their to their home country. So uh, some of my friends, uh, they are of Pakistani heritage, but they don't necessarily go back that often. They don't really have any family in the country, um, and yet they still they still they still hold Pakistan in their heart. They're still connected to the country in that way, but they won't really visit. They maybe they've missed visited once in their lives. And you have another kind, which is I guess more my kind, where we have. A lot of links still. We make several, my parents make several visits a year back to Pakistan. We have a home there. My grandparents are all there. My family's there. Um, even through the foundation, we have a foundation base there that's run there. So, uh, so it's easier for me to be able to donate back to Pakistan because I have that whole setup. Um, issues I've noticed uh, with just through my networks and through my friends is that um, when people want to give back to, to Pakistan or to, to other countries. Um, do they go through an international organisation that they, like an Oxfam or a UNICEF or, uh, or, or whatever, or where they know the name, they, there's a certain level of trust, or do they go through a local organisation where there's always all kinds of doubts is the money actually going to get there, are they actually going to use the money, how is, it, how is the organisation being operated, um, and I suppose global giving and, and platforms like that have really helped with that, and I'm actually a big fan of global giving, I think it's a fantastic tool. Um, and Nate's actually recently registered, we've got a project on global giving, <laughs> which is really exciting. Um, and, uh, and I suppose that's my second point as well, the level of trust for local organisations. And then there's a third one, do, do people over here who don't have a significant link really understand the local issues and are they then donating to the right issues? Um, I have an example where um, because I'm lucky enough to have those links and have the resources, we have, we wanted to so so people want to donate, for example, to an education project in, in Pakistan. We did a bit of research into this, and um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of organisations doing quite average work over there. They're using the teachers that they were using to run education programs were not necessarily trained teachers, or um, they did this. A lot of them didn't have any teacher training. Uh, a lot of them didn't even have a degree in the subject, but they were still made to teach young people and to, and to teach young children. Bad teachers, bad ed education, and it just sort of is a bit downhill from there. So what we, what we wanted to do as a foundation 
was to create um, a university to produce really A-class teachers. Um, and we wanted to finish with the UK University and actually the project ended up failing. But our intention was there. We were lucky to have the resources to know what the, to, to, to really figure out what the issues were. I suppose that's where somewhere like BMT comes, comes up because you guys have the research and it's and, and you guys sort of use that. You, your, your level of research is really, really extreme and then you can tell people here the rights and the wrongs when it comes to diaspora giving. Um, have I gone really about my oh, time? No. Sorry. Um, then, uh, then actually, uh, Charles asked me, when he sent me an email about what I should speak about, he said, the ways in which my giving is an expression of my multiple diaspora identities. So I had to think about that for about five minutes. <laughs> and I thought, uh, I thought the best way, actually, to describe that is the creation of MATES as an organisation. So, so just, to, just, to say, just to remind you, that's the organisation where we're sending volunteers who work with people with disabilities to run training programmes all across the world. So I suppose I'm using advantages that I have living in the UK and using that um, to, 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 try and, to try and help in Pakistan and India and in different places. Um, we've also learned, obviously, that that's not always the best way to come charging through and the UK is the best and we know the best and different countries need local, need local resources are number one priority and uh, we've learned that in-country training is Best, the best way forward, um, as well as, I mean, we can obviously supplement and help as much as we can through the UK, but um, it should be all locally led. And, uh, and and also we've done things, for example, that we've uh, trained, uh, we've sent Bangladeshi speech and language therapists to Sri Lanka to, to do some training from there, so sort of country to country um, is sometimes more appropriate. So, uh, so that's it, really. Thank you. Thank you very much. personal account of your own uh, journey and also for uh, illuminating some of the work of your family's foundation. I'm sure there'll be lots more uh, questions and uh, certainly have uh, some thoughts in mind based on the way you've developed your strategy over time and how that will inform your giving. But um, we'll hold it there so we can go to the other panellists. And um, uh, Abba, you mentioned by the in context of this talk uh, as your role at the British Asian Trust, which does try to create some structure, framework and strategy for those people that are uh, giving so thank you Charles for having me on this panel first. Um, this is an area of passion for me. I've been at the Trust for 10 years, I was the second employee uh, and it continues to be an area of passion. So we do a lot of work in this space and we think really hard about the diaspora. Um, so the Prince of Wales started the British Asian Trust. It was uh, it was a group of it was a group that the Prince of Wales brought together with uh, Asian businesses, celebrities, people like Meera Sayal and uh, Sanjeev Bhaskar, who read Goodness Gracious Me, and changed the identity of the South Asian community in the UK. And he brought them together around ten years ago because he felt that the diaspora didn't have anyone representing their needs to give in the countries of their origin. He'd also traveled to South Asia and seen the social entrepreneurship and the, the kind of energy on the ground. And he felt a connecting organization would be valuable, both to raise funds as well as to give it accessibility. Um, that, those, these are our origins. We, we started with the Prince of Wales thinking that thought and then handing it over to us. Just some background and some numbers. There are 3 million British Asians in the UK. We form 5% of the UK's population and we come from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Nepal. So this is the broader Indian subcontinent. And we all call it UK home. So this is our home, but we all come, we all have deep roots to the subcontinent, and some of us have roots to places like Kenya, Uganda as well. So we're a, we're a community that has traveled not just directly from India, some of us have, but there are others who've come from Africa as well into, into the UK. So what does the trust do? Uh, we, have, uh, we have a dual uh, identity. We seek to make a positive difference in South Asia, and we also seek to influence diaspora giving in a strategic way, in a collective way. Um, and then I wanted to pick up the nationalistic uh, question that you raised earlier. I was going to say, when, when, we, when we were set up, the fact that we are not British Indian or British Pakistani or British Bangladeshi, and the fact that our identity is about being British Asian, is, was because we wanted to counter perhaps what we saw as some of the nationalistic traits. In being a collective identity and having more in common about what we shared in being, living as, as British Asians, we felt it was a more positive message to send out that saying there was a particular country that mattered. It mattered that we had a certain 
origin, and that that is more important. So I, that sits within our DNA. We think about it quite a lot. And in the beginning, and we continue to say, when you give us funding, you can't say it's only for one region. You might have issues you want to support, but we like to encourage people to think about the region and therefore about the commonality and the beauties of what we have in common. So just to put that, yeah, put that in there as well. Um, we worked with over 50 local NGOs, many other partners, 3 million lives to date. Um, Richard and I were talking, I think we count 80% of the rich list as our Asian rich list, as, our, as, as people who've given us money, proper money which is pretty good. Uh, now lots of trusts and foundations do to DFID as well, funds us in, uh, in South Asia. Um, and people attend, support us in different ways. They work with us on their philanthropy work, they attend our events, they challenge us on Facebook, uh, all sorts of things. But people really do use us when they want to think about the region and, and we hopefully try and help them the best way we can. Um, we've learned a lot and as we grow and change and start doing things like the education development impact one that we're launching next year, uh, talk about issues that we, the community doesn't usually like to talk about like mental health and modern day slavery in the region, we hope we take them on a journey of giving which evolves from service delivery to actually challenging status quo and being a real partner to the governments uh, in the country. So this is, it's critical for us that they're evolving with us, that we are evolving with them. Um, and at, at that moment, I was thinking about the community and saying we're talking about this big, huge community, three million people. With some humility, I'm talking about the people we know, um, the people who are, the, I have to say, the more affluent, uh, affluent of the community, not the three million British Asians. It's the tip of the iceberg that has worked with us. But so I, I want to qualify my comments by saying that. But the one thing almost all of them share in common, and this is something. Uh, I find very, very unusual in, our, in my conversations with British Asians is that they seem, several of them have seen poverty, deprivation, racism in their own lives. They're first generation rich, many, many of them. I remember a conversation at a dinner once where somebody who now owns the entire taxi service for West, West London said to me, his wife is a nurse, she worked in the day, he worked at night. The children would see one parent at a time. They are supporters of us and they give us significant funding and I am proud that they understand the issues that we talk about because they've seen it in their own lives and that makes them proximate to the problem. So we are not telling them about the problem, we're telling them about solutions. We're telling them about the ways in which you can challenge some of the issues that are there or the problems that are there. So that I think is a really incredible part about being British Asian is that in India when I see the wealthy, it's fourth generation wealth often there's these people we talk about are people who've seen all kinds of deprivation in their own lives and they are uh, you know, I'm really humbled by what they tell us every day. So that's uh, that's just some context. To reflect on some trends, and I'll pick up both on Mr. Talbot's article in, in, in the magazine as well as on Sophia's from Pakistan, which I also really enjoyed. And actually, the whole issue was incredibly interesting for me to see something about our work in writing because it's what we do every day. You don't see it as a piece of literature. So it's really exciting to say, oh, there's a trend there. This is my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that was, uh, that, it was interesting to see it all written down. We don't often sit, sit down and reflect on that. It's part of our DNA, it's the way we function. Uh, it's like telling me I'm a mother, you know, and then reading a book about it in Palm's and going, oh, well, yeah, there are other people like me. So, well, I have <laughs> justice to it. So. Yeah, you totally did. So that was the exciting part about reading something about it like that. Uh, so I'll start with the top one, which you picked up too, which is that sort of generate that giving to your parents' village or going back to the community that you come from. There is a generational gap there. We start, we see older generations of people wanting to give back to their village, their community, to Kenya, to India, uh, to where they come from, so Gujarat, pa, uh, Punjab, where our community comes from here. It is true, you do want to go back and help the place where you came from. And the older generation are particularly keen on it. So it's a fact that we, we respect that. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And they often want to do, the way they want to help is to build a school or a hospital, which again we respect. The way we are challenging it slowly now is saying, why not we consider a charter school, a public-private partnership or a not-for-profit might be running a school instead of you starting a school which in three years might be closed down because you don't have the funding. So we're pushing that conversation and saying, instead of starting a school, so you could look at teacher training as, as Bahim was talking about, or girls' education, pick a cause within education. Think about it beyond starting an institution which has a name, but think about working in partnership with local not for profits. So that's that's where our work is gently challenging, working in education, but gently challenging how you might do it as against what you're doing. Because you don't start by saying, oh no, don't educate anyone because that cause is wrong to you know, work on mental health because we think that's the best thing. We, we wouldn't approach it like that. We would say, let's think education, but let's think about the structural problems India has, Pakistan has, 
how do they differ, how do they link to the SDGs, what does an SDG mean, what does it mean to you, uh, you know, that kind of a conversation. So just, uh, just all that. So within health and education, really changing the conversation on that. Um, second thing is, I must point out, the younger members of the diaspora, people like Mahin, are very different. They, are, they challenge us, they, they work with us, they, and they want to work both in, in the subcontinent and they want to work in the UK. So this is a growing trend for us. Almost every younger member of our diaspora will have some work that they fund here and they support here and they want to work back in India, Pakistan or Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. So the, the, trend, the older generation was starting to hand over where the younger people means there's a certain difference in the way the younger generation approach that kind of giving as well and they want to work in the country that is home. This is a growing trend. Problems here affect them and they affect all of us and they want to make a positive difference here. They also want to be known and seen as making a positive difference. Because when you become an active member of society, you want to be shown as caring for your environment, your people, that you love problems. That is something we do see. Uh, across the board, technology plays, uh, plays a critical role and several of our, our supporters are entrepreneurs. And this is uh, something that we think about British community. Many of them are self-made businessmen. Uh, and that me means that often they push us to be more enterprising, more innovative, more edgy, sometimes disruptive. And we love those guys who really make us challenge. Um, we challenge questions and systems and we really like working with philanthropists like that, you know, so we have one who works on the Board of Transparency International and she's always questioning us and how we think about politics and other governance within the region and, and we love people like that, uh, it makes us better people. Uh, then I have to talk about part of networks uh, and we talk about community. The reason British Asian Trust, the America India Foundation, British Pakistan Foundation, the, uh, the America Pakistan Foundation, organizations like this exist is because People give with networks. People like peers to talk to. They like talking to each other. They like telling each other what they're doing. They like the, the energy that a network creates. We all like networks and the diaspora are no different. We like our networks. Giving collectively and coming together is something that works. Um, and we, we really play on that at the trust. We have fun with our, our diaspora. We play cricket. We have big events. But we also make sure that those forums become places they can learn about issues. So, I think underestimating networks is a really bad thing to do because you then lose half the fun of giving. Giving is something that makes you a better person and therefore why not enjoy and celebrate that network as part of it. So we, we really do play with that. Um, and in that, in, that, in that networking there's also uh, this feeling that can we increase the network? So if let's say today the networks we have are of people who earn, earn more than 250,000 pounds per annum, that sort of elite within the British Asian community, they, several of them are now motivated and say, what do we do to increase those networks? The whole community is coming together and what could be those issues? It's not just money. How do we think about giving beyond money into the power of our voice? And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So that's the second point. Third is, um, and you talked about it, and then I also picked up, is let's go and sort them out mentality is being replaced by let's work with them. Uh, we see this all the time. Nobody wants to sort anybody out. They've all been to India and Pakistan and they can see there's a lot of affluence there. There's a lot of community action there. So there's no, let's give them a better solution. It is, as Mahin said, let's work with them. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we are working on a mental health program in Pakistan. It emerged from uh, two diaspora supporters, two families here, Caretech and Koshara. And now there are local health charities, the media, the government, all working together to address the booze to sort out the quality of services and to bring international best practice. It is not about the diaspora putting money in and saying, we're going to give you some money to sort it out from here with some best practice. It doesn't happen, we don't encourage it, but they don't want it either. The other thing which we love doing is working with local philanthropists. So we work with the Tata Trust in India, we work with the Edel Gay Foundation, Dastra. We believe that working in partnership with local philanthropy means that you're working collectively and that your money doesn't have an end-to-end -end cause ownership, which it, it, it never can be too small in the ocean of the countries that we're working in. But working with local foundations is critical in our success. They guide us, we guide them, we challenge them, and therefore it's, it's collective. There's no question. Right, so I'm going to stop for just one minute. What should I pick up on? Trust continues. Governance and accountability is an issue. Uh, we have to invest in that as a forum. Um, and I, I've talked about impact investment as an opportunity. I think our community is very keen. We have people like Tom Singh who are very, very interested in it. We have other people, Ramesh Wadwani, working on 
going back to yes, that. Maybe just say a, a brief word about both current impact and about development impact bonds, because you have um, launched um, that in India, maybe if you just put closing remarks on that. And then Fine. So I talked about the data, and then I can give you other things. So uh, in, on the development impact bond, one of our partners, Educate Girls, they're in the room, inspired us to start thinking about giving in philanthropy in a different way. We uh, started working with the Dell Foundation later. We bought on both the Tatas, the Mithas, Comet Relief, now Diffit, to come together to look at an outcomes-based uh, innovative finance tool in India. And I can talk to you a lot about that. But it's now going to be launched and it's, it's a $10 million bond really addressing the needs of uh, 200,000 children across three states and payments by results in terms of the fact that if, if children acquire literacy and numeracy targets, then the organizations are paid. Uh, risk capital for the organizations are provided by uh, UBS Optimus Foundation. So there's a new way of giving where we're bringing the diaspora on a journey. So that's, that's that. So that's, uh, that's where I'm going to close and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about Thank that. you. Thank you very much, Shama. I think just Abba's comments just underscore the richness of the kind of dynamism of this space uh, that we Alliance are able to tap into. And if you want a distillation of some of the trends that Abba was referring to, if you look at pages 46 and 47 um, with a uh, India Indian diaspora flag to by Rajas and Don, um, you can see some of the trends reflected in the piece uh, there. Um, but thank you, thank you very much. And um, uh, over to our final panelists, we really could not have had a, an issue, a special feature on diaspora philanthropy without heading to the issues of Israel and Palestine. Um, there could have been good reasons not to uh, engage with it. Um, there could have also been good reasons to have actually had a whole issue about the topic. But what we have done is we've attempted to do at least illuminate and begin a conversation about that sort of with uh, perspectives from Omar in the interview towards the back of the issue, as well as some perspectives on Jewish that sort of The interview of Omar is on page 55. Before you look at that, you can hear from the man himself about some of his work um, uh, in Palestine. Thank you very much. Andrew. Thank you, Charles. Well, I was roped in to speak today. I was, uh, we were, it started off as us being the host, and then I turned out to be a speaker as well. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, very welcome to you again um, to the Mosaic Rooms. It's a lovely Monday morning. And um, it's an honor also to share the panel with, uh, with the, the esteemed speakers who uh, preceded me. I think we, we need to sort of scale down because we, um, the, the scale that I will be talking about is much smaller. We are, I think, the Palestinian community in the UK is no more than 30,000. And that's really pushing it, I think. Um, if we look at the Arab community, maybe uh, we might reach half a million, I'm not sure. But the scale is smaller, certainly, in terms of the weight of the, the community here. Um, the political context and the difficulties, uh, as you might imagine, surrounding the Palestinian question um, and, and the, the uh, Palestine-Israel conflict, the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, also complicates uh, very much the relationship of the first generation diaspora with the UK. Uh, the UK's particularly perfidious role in, in um, making, um, creating the Palestinian tragedy um, didn't help, and consequently, it's a um, shameful role in, in several other wars in the region. It's, it's probably not the place to speak about here, but anyway. The, the political context does complicate matters greatly. Uh, but the legal context, of course, and the fact that many Palestinians and Arabs came um, to the UK to study, and some of them made very successful careers here, also made the UK an ideal place to, um, to start um, projects in philanthropy, uh, even though that has taken time and it was a tentative role. And I'm glad to say the Palestinian example has been actually a pioneering one. If you could just be careful with the artwork, please. Just, just be careful with that. Um, and um, in, in that sense, um, we, we kind of had to deal with several issues. First of all, a cultural issue. Um, the region uh, has a very long history of philanthropy, but it was very uh, faith-based. So uh, zakat, which is the Muslim obligation to give uh, a small part of your income to, to public uh, works, mosques, schools, uh, charitable organizations, um, obviously could not work in the same way in, in the diasporic context. Um, and um, new challenges uh, 
followed because your own relationship with your community changed in nature. Um, rather than being focused on a village or on, on a city, it became focused on national issues, um, and in some cases on faith-related issues. Um, identities, as you know, evolve, so as do our philanthropic choices and, and proclivities, and therefore um, and this was also reflected in the type of organization that came up in the diaspora. Zakat continued. There's a lot of um, Muslim uh, inspired uh, uh, and very generous uh, donating going on uh, both among Palestinian Muslims and non-Muslims uh, to Palestine. Um, and I think the Ramadan and, and the, um, the, the Feast of the Sacrifice are high points of, of contributions from the, the uh, citizens of this country who come from Muslim backgrounds to Palestine or to Palestinian causes. But the shift to institutional and strategic giving uh, took a long time, and I, I'm going to speak to you about two experiences. One is the Family Foundation, which this space is part, and the other is a, a, an association which, of which I am a, a member, which is also the owner of the Palestinian Museum, but among many other uh, philanthropic um, uh, tracks and projects. And that's called uh, the Welfare Association, Dawa. <coughs> we have our in the room, we're very lucky to have the UK representative um, of that institution here. Um, in the first instance, the Family Foundation uh, was begun uh, as a consequence of, the, of three forced exiles. My parents started it. Um, they had been forced out of Palestine in 1948, then out of Lebanon in 1975, and finally in 1990, although for thankfully a very brief period from Kuwait, um, uh, and so after three of these uh, horrific forced exiles, they um, sort of settled in the UK. I certainly settled here. I've been here since I was 11, as you can hear. In fact, I learned my English here, so... Um, <coughs> um, and, and so the relationship with the, with the countries of, of with the countries of origin, because of course Palestine was one, but so was Lebanon, and so was Kuwait. As I say, identities evolve, and and get more complicated with time. Um, but the UK offered the legal and, and the and political sort of stability for, for them to start thinking about a long-term uh, investment in, in a project, in a philanthropic project, in an institutionalized way. They've been given to education um, throughout their lives ever since they could afford to. <coughs> Both of them had started their lives as school teachers and therefore like many Palestinians of that generation, um, they knew that this was a ticket out of destitution and poverty, and, and, and so it was, uh, I, I, I do not exaggerate to say that it was a very annoying and daily obsession um, in the house. Um, education was kind of almost more important than what you ate for dinner. <laughs> um, and, and the other issue was, of course, cultural in the sense that um, it was mystifying to my parents how the Arab world, which is the center of the geographical world as far as, you know, as, far as you know, certain perspectives are concerned, uh, and is so rich culturally, so it has such a rich history, it uh, has such great mineral resources, has a relatively <coughs> educated and underpopulated, um, uh, educated people in underpopulated uh, uh, regions, how it had screwed everything up so badly. And, and, and sadly continues to do. And so the question, this question is rather a humongous and, and challenging question, was, um, was really a, a cultural one. So we, we started the foundation trying to answer, at least in a, you know, in a tentative manner, that big question, how, you know, where did the cultural stuff go wrong that makes it so difficult for us as a people to make this wonderful part of the world prosperous and and peaceful. Um, big question, of course, then you have to translate it into, into practical steps. And, and so with their connection to Palestine, it became, uh, Palestine became the focus of that, uh, of, of that work. Education and culture in Palestine is what we started doing in 99. Um, we began with a, a big investment program in, in the development of the Palestinian curriculum and and a teacher, not training so much as teacher development, um, through uh, various 
I'm going to go into here, um, including action research and other quite um, interesting ways to improve the standards of teaching in Palestinian schools. We opened a, a, a large and wonderful cultural center in Gaza City, which is a library, but it's also a theater, a music school, and, and a dance uh, space, and an IT lab, and so on. Um, and then we launched what was probably the first um, uh, in, independently funded, non-governmental, um, large-scale cultural investment program in, in, in the Arab world, actually. Uh, music, uh, literature, in the visual arts, um, and, um, and in other fields, film, and so on, and theater. And um, very much later, the sort of final chapter of that journey, we started this space 10 years ago. Um, and it was a kind of circle, so we started legally in the UK, we started our thinking here, went out to Palestine, and then came back uh, and established this center, which is sort of makes a logical uh, conclusion to that journey. I don't know what's going to happen in the next 20 years, but that's what has happened so far. But I sort of second what everybody has said. That the, the first generation has very strong emotional roots and, and relate, a relationship with, the, with its, um, with its uh, country of origin. Um, it's, um, it has the experience, the life experience, to be, to be able to perhaps make the sort of judgments that we as a second generation don't necessarily have. Um, often this is cultural, they, have, they understand the language, they understand <coughs> politics and so on. <coughs> but they also have a more ambiguous relationship to the house country. So, um, you know, and this poses its own challenges because, uh, and, and I come back to the issue of nationalism and communitar communitarianism. Um, in a minute. <coughs> um, they do not necessarily see themselves as uh, an integral part of, of this country, and therefore, in some cases, and it's, it's, it, the, the, the type of philanthropy that they do is very narrowly redirected back to the home country. Maybe this is totally legitimate, but it also poses a number of issues. Um, how you're perceived by the host country, by people who may wish to support you, who are politically engaged with you, um, who you want to uh, co-opt to work with you, rather than making them feel as sort of as guests or outsiders, and I'm talking about non-Palestinian British people or non-Arab British people. Um, the other issue is, um, is is to avoid sinking into not just a nationalist trap. So uh, I think it's legitimate to want to write to, to, to defend a, a country, particularly if it's if it's dispossessed and it's, it's under duress and uh, and its people are being unjustly treated. But what is more dangerous, I think, is when you sink into a kind of communitarianism. So um, it's us and them, and we focus just on our on our people, on our network, on our. And that's uh, that has uh, worried me greatly, especially since the uh, invention about 20 years or 15 years ago of this curious term called the British Muslim. Um, uh, we never heard of British Muslims until Tony Blair. Uh, enlightened us. We were always, <laughs> it's true, we were British Pakistanis or British Palestinians or British, but British, you know, to be identified with your faith was quite a, a worrying trend. And, it, and I think one of the things we try to do in this space is to kind of break that. In fact, we insist on what seems to be a, a nationalist uh, description, i.e. we focus on the cultures of the Arab world, actually to counter, and I remember thinking about this very clearly 10 years ago, to counter that um, uh, worrying trend that was happening um, uh, towards greater uh, isolationism, greater um, definition by your faith. I mean, you know, it's very, very strange to be in a 21st century liberal democracy and to be told you have to identify yourself by your faith. I mean, this is seriously, seriously worrying. And so those challenges also reflect themselves in the, in the way that strategies are built and the way that um, you prioritize. And I think it's, you have a, a, a right, uh, uh, I would 
argue this very strongly to, to, to decide where you want to spend your money, uh, especially if you're doing it um, uh, perfectly legally. But it's also perfectly legitimate, I think, for the public and for recipients to say, well, are you actually really giving uh, to charity or are you just reinforcing your status or um, supporting one group at the expense of the other or, or uh, deepening and entrenching isolation and, and communitarianism. Now, there is a British genius for community relations which has worked very well compared to the French model which has been so alienating to minorities and so on. So therefore there is an argument to let people do what they want. You know, so what if they just want to give to, to Jews or Muslims or, or Catholics or you know or whatever, or Palestinians, let them do it. But there is also, I think, a question about the, which I would like to end with. <coughs> oh no, I have to speak about the other organization as well. Just doing like one, one minute more. Just okay, one more. But, 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 there is a, but there is, I think, a, a, a very important sort of ethical question about always, um, it's, I think it's fine, and it's, in fact, it's probably very effective, much more effective to focus on one group or one area or one special needs uh, um, uh, group, but always, I think, keep in mind that you that the charitable sector is a public sector. It's not there for your public, for your personal benefit, or for the, the benefit of your community in, in the communitarian sense. Um, and I argue this for this very strongly, and I hope that our organization will grow to become much more inclusive. I'll give you a, a, a small anecdote. We were uh, we are doing a, an exhibition by an Iranian artist next year, and we had it raised a lot of eyebrows, and I had never thought it might because uh, some Iranians don't think that that would be right to, to host for an Arab organization, an Arab art organization, to host an, an Iranian artist. Yeah. Um, and we've hosted English artists, so I don't see why we can't host you know Iranian ones. But so those sort of banal banal issues will come up, I think. In, in, deeper, in the deeper uh, context of, um, of prioritizing, what you prioritize, and also in the challenge of becoming more than just a community organization. The, the, the other model I wanted to speak about you know, to reinforce the, the strength of networking. We, the Palestinian Museum, of which I was chair for five years, the founding chair, was actually a, an initiative started by an organization um, this is called Taoan Welfare Association. And that, is, that was the first sort of big institutionalized effort by a group of Palestinian businessmen, women, and, and intellectuals to bring resources together to help Palestinian communities outside the context of the Palestine, Palestine Liberation Organization for politics, and strictly speaking within a developmental ethos. And it's been in existence for over 35 years. It works across the board a bit like the organization in health and in, uh, with disability and so on and so forth, education, culture. Um, but the, the networking power of that, of that organization has been quite tremendous and it's, it's, uh, it's allowed uh, for many Palestinians who would otherwise prefer to stay uh, below the radar in, in the diaspora to say, hey, actually, there are institutions in Palestine run by Palestinians where well, we know where our money is going to go, and we can give it back. And so the partnership issue is really essential, is that the diaspora needs to understand that without those uh, partner organizations, and they need to invest in them, um, the process cannot be it will always be unbalanced, it will always be distant. They need to have those close contacts. Sorry, I thought I that was a very well, thank you very much. And that was a very appropriate note to end on um, the role of Taiwan and the Palestinian Museum in uh, galvanizing Palestinian diasporas. And uh, there's a beautiful photo of the Palestinian Museum on, on page 56. And if you are over in the region, I uh, do encourage you to visit, which I hope to be able to do someday myself. Um, but with that, I just want to thank you and my other panelists for their contributions. And thank you all for bearing with us a little bit longer than usual while we have um, tapped into the expertise that's on the panel. But now I want to just open up the conversation to all of uh, you here.
Uh, and uh, if you'd like more questions and comments, please do say your name uh, as well as organisation. Uh, who would, uh, does anyone like to raise any questions first? So I have an um, idea in front. Yes. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you very much for um, what I thought was really interesting just to hear the um, experiences of, um, uh, of um, um, fundraising and, I guess, philanthropy. So I, uh, I work with an organization called um, Afford, uh, which um, um, Eleanor was mentioning earlier. And Afford is uh, the African Foundation for Development in the UK, and a lot of our work is with the African diaspora, and essentially what you do is to enhance and expand their contributions to um, the uh, continent. Part of what we've been trying to do recently has been very much around how we raise philanthropy, how do we structure remittances, um, not necessarily remittances, but how do we structure giving uh, amongst the African diaspora in a more structured way. And we're looking at things like, um, I know that Abba had mentioned about the bond, so we're doing some work uh, which is around developing a bond with Rwanda, so that's very structured. We've also done some work around, we provide grants for diaspora and um, entrepreneurs, so part of what we do is to provide um, a matched grant, which is about, uh, which is 80% and they put in 20%. So over the last three years, we can say for a fact that diaspora have put in something like 200,000 pounds into job creation on the continent. Now we're looking more around the philanthropy and crowdfunding side, which is where we find that there is a challenge. And I liked what um, Abba, I think, had said uh, around some of the things around how you challenge people uh, in giving, uh, you know, in terms of um, the way that they actually give. And um, what we're finding um, and doing this uh, with global giving is that while the African diaspora um, give in very interesting ways, so they give to um, they give to um, to their yeah, sort of churches, faith-based um, activities, they'll give to the hometown association, so it's very direct in that sense. And they also give through remittances. We know that remittances are actually very, very um, significant. But we're finding that with this specific accelerator, um, people are not necessarily asking, I think, and there is an issue of capacity, which we know, but they're not asking, uh, they're not really utilizing their networks. Um, but also, I think very much about the unlearning we were talking about earlier. They, they seem to be waiting for other people to put money into the pot before they put anything into it. Um, and so we're still trying to understand where the gap is and how we um, support them and their own new life networks to give a bit more. So I guess the questions uh, I had, and actually first also to say thank you to Eleanor for the plugs, <laughs> but uh, the question that I had was really around your own experiences um, uh, of, uh, of engaging with, so in terms of the networks and the partnerships and how it all started, the very sort of early days, what were some of the challenges and what were the breakthroughs, I suppose, and um, I just wanted to understand a little bit more of that just to see how we can learn from Thank you, so we'll take a couple before we go back to the panel. Um, I think it's a perfect segue on to the last question. So I'm Patricia Hadzai, I'm a trustee of Black Cultural Archives in Midrash Square in Brixton. And one of the projects that I'm trying to work on is actually to do research into exactly the question that was just asked. Because I, as you can tell Matt, I'm from America, we've done some research in black philanthropy in America and the sources of and how giving it black by black, I mean African and Caribbean heritage people. And here there are two million, like the three million, there are two million. African and Caribbean heritage people, but the profile of their giving, their philanthropy, is really unknown. There's been pretty much no research into that. So understand why people give, what would they give to some, you know, as a community, whether internationally in terms of home countries or here in the UK, we are seen as recipients of charity and not givers. Although through our churches and our mosques and other ways, we do give a lot, but there's just no quantum. And therefore, with no quantum, there's no political voice behind that, you know, behind what the community can give and should give. And then there's no intentionality about what kind of things they would give to you. So I do think, and I'd like to ask the panel, how important is that research to really understand and interrogate that it, as a way as well as bringing the community together in order for them to, to have that voice and to be able to demonstrate their potentiality. <coughs> for example, at the BCA, right now we're in the midst of the Windrush children, you know, Fiorori, 
it just highlights how much education, curriculum, preserving heritage and history is vital to people living in this country from wherever they come from. But again, there's there's no place for a, you know for for support of that. You know, we have to continually try to channel the community's interest in making sure that they care about where, that those land records are shredded and weren't donated or telling their oral histories, giving their oral history as so we can document their presence. So I think, again, research, it may be the most banal part of the work, but it is, for, for us, I think, essential. That is another excellent point. Thank you. And I'll just take a third um, question, uh, if there is one, um, from anyone in the back. Um, I, so I run the Sorry, I'm Boris Miller. I run the Environmental Funders Network in the UK, and we are starting to think about how we might um, engage UK-based class from various countries to support environmental work in their countries. And no one's touched on that, so I'm really just interested in sort of finger in the wind or temperature test to see is anyone talking about it? Are you hearing concern? Is there interest from the communities that you're engaging with? And that could be anything from climate change affecting people's livelihoods to biodiversity for biodiversity's sake. Thank you, Three great questions. One on um, the early days and galvanising support. One on how you change the terms of the debate and give agency and voice uh, to people rather than simply being recipients. And then this question about climate change and environment. Um, if I can turn um, to you, Mahin, first, um, to take really any one of those three um, to place on questions we raised to the <coughs> I'd just like to add to the questions to say, actually, I've got a lot of very wealthy friends who don't donate, and how do I get them to donate? Or how do they? How do we change their mindset? And I, for me, I actually find it really hard to understand why someone wouldn't want to uh, give back or to to to, uh, to donate, whether it's in their own country or they live in. Um, but yeah, I, I I just I don't understand. Well, what was it that made your family donate? I think, well, between my generation and my father's generation, it was something that we'd grown up with and we'd grown up seeing, because my grandfather was the one who initially, who initially created this foundation, who wanted to give, and who, uh, who, who set it all up. I just grew up thinking it was a normal part of life. We were, we were forced when we were kids to go to these boring um, events where they, you know, at schools and, and all sorts of causes that my parents had, had supported. Uh, but during that time, it was obviously ingrained into us that this is just the normal way to do your privilege, so give back. Um, and uh, I guess where families have not been as encouraging, how do you encourage people to give back? Yeah, so great questions. Um, I guess a couple of things that have occurred to me. So one thing, for Stella and I, it prompted me, is I'm really glad, one, that um, global giving and Afford decided to collaborate. So glad that Afford didn't build a platform to then realise how challenging it was because it would have been like, very expensive. So I think for all the foundations in this room, look to collaborate with the people because that is critical when you're talking about the environment. There is things. So for the last three years, we've done some testing around access to um, off the grid kind of populations in terms of energy. So looking at renewable energy, which we've done in collaboration with Energy for Impact. And we've been doing some research and some pilot testing together. Um, it's really interesting, we never even thought about the diaspora question. We were just looking at how can we move away from just grants to a more diverse and flexible funding base for energy initiatives. And I can share a couple of reports with you. They went much beyond donation-based crowdfunding to private equity and peer learning, but maybe there was a missing part of the data. I was just thinking, Stella, maybe what we need to do is we need like a, a social innovation lab with the African diaspora group, like real collective, because I think it's about lack of ownership. I think that certain African diaspora are not giving to diaspora organisations because they don't feel that they're owning the solution, so there is a trust issue. Um, I can think maybe we want to try a social lab innovation to give people that ownership and control. Um, and then with the no quantum, no voice, which I think is a great way to describe it with the Afro-Caribbean population, it's true that their giving platform, giving habits are much more splintered, perhaps because unlike my colleague at the end, I think that 
kind of many of my friends from the African Caribbean community feel really integrated into the community. And I think one of the devastating things with what has happened, kind of with what is known as kind of the Windrush story, is it's made people feel alienated. And so actually, I see much more NAPS standard giving platform giving patterns amongst African, especially younger Afro Caribbeans. But when you look at the power of the British Asian Trust. It shows you that you want to be organised. No, exactly. There is a need for the research and there is a need for practical research. So it's not a traditional piece of academic research, it's practical how we galvanise and organise. So we have the power to also go to DFID to get some money to push. But I am seeing more organisations trying to link kind of with the Caribbean of late. So I see movement, but it needs to be accelerated. It's probably as much as I'm allowed to